Reflexes are an extremely important part of the neurological examination for a number of reasons. Uh, one, in the office it's often very useful to use reflexes to help us know where in the nervous system the lesion is. And secondly, they don't require any cooperation from the patient at all. So if you have somebody who won't cooperate with you or can't cooperate because they're very sick in the hospital, in the ICU, you can certainly do reflexes and you can learn a lot about what's wrong with the nervous system. Now there are four kinds of reflexes. We name them according to their purpose. They have survived the exigencies of evolution because they obviously served some purpose along the way and that's how we name them. The first group are called the proprioceptive reflexes. Proprioceptive meaning that they're stimulated by the stimulation of a proprioceptive organ, in this case the intramuscular uh, proprioceptor, the muscle spindle. These are sometimes called muscle stretch reflexes and sometimes incorrectly called deep tendon reflexes. There's five of these, three in the upper extremity and two in the lower, and I'm going to show you how to elicit those correctly. Second category are the nociceptive reflexes, meaning they're stimulated by a noxious stimulus, meaning something which is potentially tissue damaging, usually something that scratches the skin in one place or another, at least a tickle, which is a minor form of pain, or pain itself. And these reflexes are less well known as far as their wiring diagram is concerned, but often quite important as well, particularly uh, one or two of the most useful ones. The third category of reflex are what we call the anti-gravity reflexes. These are primitive reflexes that helped our former ancestors stand upright in the face of severe neurological injury. There's two subtypes. One is so-called decerebration or the four-limbed anti-gravity posture in which the animal internally rotates and extends all four limbs. You can imagine how a cat would then stand up on the floor of the jungle. This is decerebration. And a slightly higher level reflex in which the legs do the same, but the upper extremities adduct and flexed as if the animal were pulling itself into a tree or feeding itself. This is called the decortication reflex. These are all reflexes that really are seen only in very ill damaged patients. You really don't see them in otherwise normal people. And finally, there are the so-called release reflexes. These are, are reflexes which are hardwired into our nervous system. They occur with development. We see them at birth and they are related to the stage of development. Sucking, snouting, rooting, so on. They disappear with normal development by the age of a year or so. Most of them disappear. And then as a person grows old, with aging and neurodegeneration, some of them come back. And rarely, that's useful to us uh, neurologically. So let me show you how to elicit these four kinds of reflexes. We're gonna start with the proprioceptive reflex. And for that we use, uh, I, I guess, the most classical tool of the neurologist, the uh, reflex hammer. This particular one that I have is a, is a pediatric version of the Babinski uh, hammer. Uh, invented and popularized by Joseph uh, Babinski, whose name will come up in a minute again as we talk about nociceptive uh, reflexes. There are many other kinds of reflex hammers. I don't have a strong feeling about which one is better. I think it's a matter of your own experience, your own comfort. I like this one because of the way it's weighed, uh, and uh, I can use it as a nice lever, and yet it's small and will fit my white coat pocket, and I can carry it around on the ward. Uh, the really big long ones, sometimes called the queen square hammer, are fine in an office like this if you have a place to put the hammer, but you can't really carry it around the service very uh, conveniently. I find that uh, the Taylor hammer, the little one, looks like a tomahawk, is a problem for me because it just isn't heavy enough in most cases to, uh, to give me that nice swing that I need to uh, elicit the reflex. There is a bit of an art to eliciting these uh, muscle stretch reflexes. There's three of them in the upper extremity and two in the lower, for which we know the wiring diagram very precisely. That's the biceps, triceps, brachioradialis reflexes of the upper extremity, and the quadriceps and the Achilles reflex in the lower extremity, otherwise known as the knee jerk and the ankle jerk. So the, a good way to elicit it is to have the person either sit on the examining table the way Alan is sitting, or I often have people sit opposite me in a chair. So they're, they're in a chair, I just sit down right opposite, I pull my chair up right opposite them so I can look right at them and uh, do, do the reflex. 
<clears throat> one of the keys here is to not hit the muscle belly itself because if you hit the muscle belly itself, as I've already demonstrated to you, the muscle will contract. There's the brachioradialis contracting because I hit it directly. That is not this muscle stretch reflex. That's a myotatic reflex. It's important, but for a different reason than, than these. What you have to do here is, is put your thumb over the tendon and I'm going to try to elicit the biceps reflex here on this side by hitting my own thumb. And there's the reflex. Uh, on this side, I'll turn my hand over. If I'm standing in front of somebody, I'll turn my hand over, put my thumb here. You don't have to help me, just relax completely. And I'll hit my own thumb. I don't know if you can appreciate seeing that reflex. I can feel it. Uh, often in young uh, people, particularly young men who have big muscles, uh, the reflex can be dampened somewhat, but you can virtually always get it. There's the biceps reflex. Now for the triceps, uh, you can actually cheat a little bit because the tendon of the triceps is way down here and the muscle is up there. So in fact, you don't really have to put your finger over the triceps. A lot of people do uh, just to remind themselves and to remind others that you should not hit the muscle directly. And you can do that by putting your thumb here over the biceps tendon and your second finger over the triceps tendon and then just hit, hit each of them sequentially to bring out the reflex. And you can see that triceps reflex, I think, very, uh, very nicely. It's easy to, you can cheat a little on this one, drop it like a dead weight, you say to the patient, just relax, let me hold the limb. And you can hit it right there and get the reflex. Do you all see that reflex happening? There it is. And I'm not hitting the muscle directly, I'm hitting the tendon, so that's a real muscle stretch reflex. We grade these reflexes uh, 0 to 4, 0 is absent, 1 is depressed, 2 is average, 3 is increased, and 4 means that when I tap once we get more than one reaction. Some people call that clonus. It's fairly objective, very much like the MRC strength testing uh, numbers. If I say something's a 2, another experienced neurologist would probably call it a 2. These, these biceps and triceps and, and Allen are twos, they're average uh, reflexes for a young man. Let's do the brachioradialis. <clears throat> if you want to be really a purist, you put your fingers over the tendon, hit the tendon. But with this reflex, you can also cheat a little bit, grab the fingers like this, drop it like a dead weight, and sort of crawl up the brachioradialis tendon until you get the reflex. And there it is. You see it? So that's the brachioradialis reflex, a nice average, uh, average reflex. Biceps, triceps, brachioradialis. The knee jerks, uh, you can have the person have their feet hanging like this, or if you really would like to uh, get the reflex a little easier, you can have them come forward, put their feet flat on the ground, and what that does is it loads the muscle a little bit, gives you a better reflex. Um, let's see what they look like. It's a nice average quadriceps reflex. You all see that? You don't have to worry about putting your finger here because remember the quadriceps muscle is above the patella and the tendon is below the patella, so no problem doing that without having to. Uh, now you notice when I do it, don't grab the hammer way up here and sort of hit like this. Have a terrible time getting the reflex. Let it swing. You don't have to hit it hard. Let the hammer do the work. That's what's nice about these nice Babinski uh, hammers. And uh, the ankle jerk I think you find easier if you slide forward a little bit, Alan, so your feet are on the on the ground. Feet are flat. Good. And you come down here and again I don't have to put my I don't have to put my finger over that tendon. Tendon's way down there near the near the heel. And the muscle is way up here. But you can see that takes the foot right off the ground. It's got a nice average uh, reflex. And if you're having trouble getting the reflex you can do something called the gendrasic maneuver. This is a functional transection of the spinal cord. So we're, gonna, we're going to occupy the spinal cord at a higher level and it's almost as if we've, we've cut the spinal cord. Remember, a lot of what descends in the spinal cord is inhibitory. So if I can take the spinal cord out temporarily, the reflex should get bigger. So let's have you link your hands like this. Don't pull. You're going to pull like that in a minute, but don't pull till I tell you. Let's put your feet forward a little bit more. Let's see what that quadriceps reflex looks like. Give it a good pull. And you can see that break makes the reflex bigger. So if you, if you uh, can only get the reflex with the gendrasic maneuver, some people will call that a, you can relax, thanks, 
call that a trace reflex. I don't like to use the word trace. I think either a reflex is there or it isn't there. You have to develop confidence that you can get reflexes and that when you can't get them, it's pathological. It's not good to be in a position where you can't get reflexes. It's like not being able to see the fundus or something. You, you have to, if you're a professional, you got to get them. And because when you don't get them, you have to be able to say, that's not normal for me. I get reflexes, and uh, not getting it is abnormal. Uh, don't, uh, don't attribute loss of reflex to aging alone. It is true that as we grow older, we develop some sensory neuronopathy. And by the time you're 90 or so, a lot of people uh, have reduced ankle jerks. That's true, based on the length rule. Now, those are the longest dendrites. But you should, you should really never attribute a loss of a reflex to aging alone, or you're going to miss things that are really important. And the main reason that older people have a higher incidence of reduced reflexes is that older people have accumulated the diseases that take away reflexes. Huh? They've had more years of diabetes. They've had more years of drinking alcohol. They've had more episodes of sciatica than the rest of us. And by the time they get to be 90, a lot of people have lost their reflexes. But you should be able to say why they've lost their reflexes. <clears throat> if you don't do that, you're taking a very important card out of your hand. I mean, put yourself in an emergency department some night. A guy his age comes in, says he's had diarrhea for a week, and now he's feeling tingling in his feet. And you examine him, and he has no ankle jerks. What would you say? Well, what you should say is, I think this is, this is a serious post-infectious neuropathy. It could be the so-called Guillain-Barre syndrome. You should not say to yourself, well, I don't ever get ankle jerks. I'm no good at getting ankle jerks. You know, the fact that I don't get them doesn't mean anything. You see what I mean? You have to, you have, if the tool is going to be useful to you, you have to be able to say, I can get these things, and the fact that I don't get them is abnormal, period. So those are the proprioceptive reflex, very, very helpful for a lot of things. If a person came to you with uh, pain in the arm, neck pain, and you thought, well, they pinched a nerve at C6 or something, you should be able to show that there's an asymmetric reflex on the two sides. That should be very, very helpful to you. Somebody with sciatica pain down the leg, the ankle jerk is absent on one side. You would say, aha, that's a disc herniation at L5-S1. So you see how helpful these reflexes are when you know the wiring diagram and you can get them every time. So there's the five proprioceptive reflexes. I would consider them part of my screening neurological exam. I don't think you can say that you've done a neurological exam if you haven't done this. Then there's the nociceptive reflexes. These are ones uh, much more complicated, long loop reflexes. A lot of them go up into the brain. We don't know as much about the wiring diagram, but they can sometimes be useful. We've already tested one of them. That's the corneal reflex. That's a nociceptive reflex. So we touched a little cotton to the eye, to the cornea, and both eyes blinked when we were checking our cranial nerves. That's a nociceptive reflex, and very useful to test in some circumstances. But the most reliable, the most important, the most famous sign in all of neurology is the plantar response. So if I can have you lie down, the plantar response uh, has been described by many, many, many different neurologists in the end of the 19th century. There are many names applied to the different ways of getting the plantar response, but there's no doubt that the most famous of these is Babinski sign. Um, Joseph Babinski, Joseph Felix Babinski was a registrar of uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, uh, a very eminent, uh, became a very eminent uh, neurologist. Uh, in, in the last uh, decade of the 19th century, uh, he wrote two papers, sequential papers, on two aspects of this response, uh, which in most people's minds have been fused together. One is called the toe sign, meaning when you scratch the bottom of the foot laterally, coming across medially across the ball of the foot, the, the big toe, after a short delay, extends, dorsiflexes. That's abnormal. He said whenever you see that, that means there's a corticospinal tract lesion, a supranuclear lesion of the corticospinal tract. Very reliable. I would say the most reliable sign in all of neurology. Never, never been proved wrong in all the years since it was described in the mid part of the 1890s. In a separate paper, he wrote uh, another, he, he described another sign which he called the fan sign. Scratch the bottom of the foot in a similar way. And on this occasion, the other four toes splay apart like a fan. 
Sometimes you see them together, the toe goes up, the other toes splay apart. Those are both of Babinski's signs, the first and second sign of Babinski. I think most people have them sort of mixed up in their mind. They're looking for both aspects of it. So you, how do you elicit this? There are many ways of eliciting it that you'll read in the literature. Uh, the best way, you, remember, you have to produce a noxious stimulus. If it doesn't tickle or hurt, then it's not going to cause the reflex. So let's look at the reflex. I'm going to scratch the bottom of the foot laterally and watch the toe. So you see that the toe goes down. That's the normal response. The other toes do not splay apart. Now, you know, it's, it's not pleasant, and you try to do this near the end of the exam and only do it once. Now, he's not going to be able to imitate a Babinski sign. You, you're just going to have to learn by doing these yourself what a Babinski sign looks like. But what would happen is that after scratching the toe, there would be a delay. And then this toe would dramatically go up like that. And sometimes the other four would splay apart. <clears throat> That's Babinski sign. You shouldn't be one of these people that talks about equivocal Babinski. Uh, Babinski sign is either there or it isn't there. In this case, it isn't there, period. There is no Babinski sign. If Babinski sign is present, then there's a corticospinal tract lesion, period. Think how important and useful that is. Somebody comes into your emergency department tingling in the feet. You don't know whether this is a neuropathy or a myelopathy. How are you going to decide? you're going to look for Babinski sign. If you find Babinski sign, that's a spinal cord disease. If you don't, it's probably a neuropathy. Right? There's two completely different categories of illness. You have somebody who says that they have right-sided weakness and you're not sure whether it's real or not. You're going to look for Babinski sign because nobody can fake Babinski sign. Right? If, if you see Babinski sign, that's real. That finding is real. That's a corticospinal tract disease. If you don't, then all bets are off. We don't know whether it's real or not. So this remains, after all this time, uh, one of the most important signs we have. You'll see a lot of neurologists squeezing the calf, Gordon's sign, running their hand down the anterior part of the tibia, uh, scratching on the side, tweaking the little toe. All these things have eponyms. And, and they sometimes work in people who are very, very bad off with spasticity and spinal cord disease but there's nothing as reliable as Babinski sign. And there's really no advantage uh, to doing all of these other, uh, these other tests. Uh, you should really emphasize Babinski sign. The other nociceptive reflexes are all much, much less reliable, other than the corneal and looking for Babinski sign. For example, there's something called the um, abdominal reflex. You see the belly button is here. If you scratch each quadrant, you'll see that the belly button moves toward the quadrant. He's a young guy, he's got good muscles in his abdomen, and they're there, all four quadrants, one, two, three, and four. They're all present. Now, the problem with this is it disappears in a lot of normal people. Pregnancy takes it away virtually always, never comes back again. Uh, obesity might take it away. Uh, some people have them, some people don't have them. Uh, not that reliable. Now, that doesn't mean there's never a time when they're useful. Sometimes uh, it's useful. Uh, you have somebody with a possible spinal cord lesion at T10. That's the belly button. You find the two lower ones are absent. The two upper ones are present. Well, that supports your contention that there's a spinal cord illness at that level T10. But by and large, not very helpful. We're not going to, in this uh, videotape, examine genitalia. You'll be happy to know, but, uh, uh, but in actual fact, sometimes we do have to examine genitalia. I mean, it might be complaints, numbness around the penis or vagina, the anus. We would, do re we would look, and there are some reflexes that we sometimes look for in that region. Uh, one is called the cremasteric reflex, in which we s scratch the inner thigh and look for the scrotum to contract. Also quite unreliable. A lot of uh, times people just don't have this reflex. So. The fact that it's often not there in normal people makes it very unreliable, not very useful for us. There's something called the anal wink in which you can touch around the anus with a sharp stimulus and the anus will contract. Uh, sometimes we do use that reflex in people with a problem in the cauda equina, the conus medullaris, but again, not particularly reliable. May or may not be present in normal people. So you can see uh, when you have a situation in which normal people don't have the finding, you don't know what to make out of it when you can't find it. 
that's a, a theme around reflexes that I wanted to make sure I develop with you so you understood how important it was to get used to getting the reflexes that you should get, to be confident that you can always get them so that their absence actually means something. Otherwise, it doesn't really mean anything. As far as anti-gravity reflexes are concerned, you can sit up again. Um, we don't test for them in people who are normal like this. They aren't going to be present. Uh, what we do is look in very sick comatose patients, people with brain stem lesions, and we will often see them. However, very, very rare, the decerebration and decortication reflexes actually help us to localize a lesion and help a patient. It's really not a practical uh, test to do. And finally, I do want to mention the release reflexes. Very important to pediatric neurologists, pediatricians, people interested in development, because this is how we measure the development of a little baby. Baby is born, has a lot of these reflexes hardwired into its nervous system. And you're all aware that babies have sucking and snouting and rooting reflexes. They have a number of others as well. And as their nervous system matures and they become myelinated, these reflexes uh, go away. They stay away for the most of the midlife and may come back in older people. The problem here again is a lot of normal people have these reflexes. What does that mean? If there's nothing wrong with the person, the fact that they have a little bit of one of these primitive reflexes doesn't mean a lot to me. I would say if they are very exaggerated, it might be helpful. Well, how do we uh, elicit them? Well, you might take the person's hand like this, uh, not give them any commands. Just reach into the hand and move your hand across the palm. If the person involuntarily grabs your hand, you might say, don't grab my hand. If they still do it, and that's pathological. That's a, that's a baby's reflex. Babies do that involuntarily, but adults do not. So you say, well, that might be something. Then you make a visual stimulus toward the mouth. Uh, he watches it come near his mouth. He doesn't do anything. If you see this, or the mouth moving as you come near it. That's abnormal. That's an, that's an infant's reflex. It should not be there in a normal adult. If you touch around the mouth or tap with or without your reflex hammer, I won't hurt you. I'm just going to touch you. In him, you see, there's no response. He doesn't pout his lips. If you let your jaw hang open, let me tap. He doesn't have a jaw jerk, a reflex, when I tap his jaw. I think all these have a similar meaning tap on one side, tap on the other side. We don't see any of those. In, in many old people, you do. If you tap around the face, uh, the face jerks, jumps, moves, puckers. And yet the person is otherwise a normal person. I don't worry about it. They really only have a meaning when they're very extreme in the context of a, of a real neurological disease. The person is becoming demented, their behavior is changing, and I find this grasping, sucking, snouting, rooting, and so on. So these reflexes don't have that much use. Uh, I would say they have limited use in the context of a bigger neurological disorder. So in summary, uh, reflexes are extremely important, not just in office patients, but in uh, hospitalized patients. There's four kinds. Proprioceptive, otherwise known as the muscle stretch reflexes. Nociceptive, the most important ones of which are the corneal and the plantar, the abnormal plantar, of course, known as Babinski's sign. The anti-gravity reflexes present in very sick neurological patients, but not quite, not really that useful. And the uh, release reflexes, the things that are normal, hardwired, gone with normal growth and development, and back with aging and disease, only useful in the context of the rest of the uh, history and examination. So there's a, an overview of how to use reflexes to help you understand the neurological exam.